On June 26, 2001, just a day before her birthday, a 52-year-old Caucasian woman, Karen Moore, left her residence in Davie, Florida at 7 p.m. and would never return home. The next day, her 8-year-old daughter Christina would come home from summer camp for her mother's birthday, but her mother would not be there to pick her up. Where could Karen have gone? Was there any foul play involved? Would she ever come back? These were questions that troubled Christina for 22 long years until now. Today, we are looking at the 22-year-old cold case solved in 2023 by the depths of history. But first, if you haven't subscribed to our channel, please hit the subscribe and like buttons. Davy, a homey suburban town in Broward County, Florida, offers the comfort of a close-knit community and the vibrancy of Western-themed attractions. The evergreen sunshine, warm climate, and the proximity to beaches are attraction points for tourists as well as residents. It is famous for housing college students, as Davy is the hub of multiple university campuses. Home to over 110,000 people, Davy provides abundant recreational activities, quality education, and neighborly living situations. And it is here in Davy that our case begins today. Thomas Stewart Moore and Olga Charlotte Moore were blessed with a baby girl on the 27th of June, 1948. They named her Karen Elizabeth Moore. She also had a sister named Pam. As she grew up, Karen enjoyed cooking, hiking, sailing, and playing the piano. Karen had a keen interest in traveling since her childhood. Nobody would have predicted that she would travel away one day and never come back. She completed her Associate of Arts degree in 1968 and graduated as a Bachelor of Science majoring in nursing in 1979. In 2001, at the age of 53, Karen Elizabeth Moore was going through a divorce with her husband. She had a restraining order against him. They had an eight-year-old daughter together named Christina, whom Karen got full custody of. Before she went missing, Karen was employed as a nurse at the Edge Point Estate Retirement Community in Boca Raton. But even though she worked full-time, she never compromised on providing a quality childhood for Christina. She made sure to give Christina the best years of her life. Christina, too, remembers Karen as a dedicated mother. Despite her job as a nurse, Karen found time to take Christina to the zoo and do other activities with her, simply to spend quality time together. She wanted to ensure a happy and healthy childhood for her daughter. But soon, the happy picture of this family would turn into a sad story filled with a myriad of questions. The 27th of June 2001 was Karen's 53rd birthday. Christina came back home from her Girl Scout camp to celebrate with her mother, but Karen never came to pick her up. The first suspicion that something was wrong arose when Karen didn't show up. Karen was a nurse, so it was possible that she might have been busy at work. But Karen was always available for her daughter, and if she had work, she would have sent someone else to receive Christina. The fact that no one was there was very strange. As the day passed by, the story got even more mysterious. The previous day, on June 26th, around 6.30 in the evening, Karen had paid her neighbor's son for mowing her lawn. That was the last time someone had seen her. She had then taken her white 1999 Saturn and left the house around 7 p.m. No one had any idea why she had left the house or where she could have gone. When she didn't return home, a police complaint was filed by Karen's sister, Pam Kleiss. Pam revealed that Karen had called her estranged husband to pick up Christina before leaving for work in the morning the day she disappeared. Later, she had exchanged a brief interaction with her neighbor's son and then left the house. What happened after these incidents is anyone's guess. She was supposed to work the next day. Keith Creedall was the executive director of the retirement home Edge Point Estates where Karen worked as a nurse. He mentioned that Karen had a punctual and responsible working history of eight years. Karen was so sincere about her work that she would have informed the establishment in case of any urgent endeavor she had. Everyone knew that Christina meant everything to her. There was no doubt that Karen didn't leave voluntarily. Now, was this just a distressing accident or was something else at play here? With rising suspicions and no real leads, the police had limited resources to find Karen Moore. The first step was to track her vehicle. At the time of her bizarre disappearance, Karen was driving a white 1999 Saturn Ford door with the license plate Dow THD. Her car also had an Indiana State University decal on the back. This information was distributed to the public with every possible detail. James Frankie Eyes, a detective at the Davie Police Department, received a tip from a woman saying she had seen the same car in South Miami-Dade County. But the information could not be verified or backed by any other witnesses. In a frantic effort to take the case forward, the police released a missing poster detailing Karen's physical appearance. 
The posters read that she had brown eyes, brown hair, and prescription glasses. Her height was listed as 5 feet 4 inches. With no success so far, the police were struggling for leads to find the whereabouts of Karen. The initial inspection of her house was enough of an indicator to anticipate bad news. All her clothing, luggage, and even her cell phone were found at home. A closer look at her house made it evident that there were no signs of forced entry or foul play. The detective suspected that Karen must have left the house voluntarily. However, what caused her to leave was still unclear. Frank Keyes informed the public that the police were looking into the financial and telephone records of Karen Moore. The possibility of theft or robbery was immediately shunned when her bank account and credit card showed no activity. This also meant that Karen was in a bad state. After all, with all her necessary items still at home, she would have required cash to sustain herself. Her relatives requested the police department to search for Karen with a helicopter. But with no knowledge of the direction that Karen could have driven in, the police couldn't proceed further. The Moore family and the entire police department released missing person posters with rewards, but Karen had completely vanished without any trace. Days turned into months and months turned into years and Karen's family were left waiting for her to come home. Years upon years went by, but Karen did not return. Her daughter, Christina, got married and had children of her own, but there was still no information about what had happened to Karen that day. On January 6, 2023, Brian Lockhart, a scuba diver and the owner of the YouTube channel Depths of History, accompanied Michael Rodriguez and Mike Sullivan, heading the Sunshine State Sonar team in searching the local water bodies in Broward County. With the help of advanced sonar technology, they found a car in a retention pond in Davie. When Michael noticed his underwater sonar system lighting up, the entire team was quick to identify that they had hit the wheels of a car in the water. It took them about 15 minutes to finally find the car. When Brian dove to examine it, he found an open trunk and a license plate under three feet of muck. They knew they had found something substantial, but they were not sure about its details and whether it was related to any old cases. Brian quickly rushed to contact the Davy Police Department. Even 22 years after Karen's strange disappearance, Davy Police hadn't forgotten about her. When they arrived at the scene the next day, they had to send the divers back into the water. The car was pulled out of the water and was sent for further inspection. The car matched the description of the vehicle Karen was driving when she disappeared. The license plate of Karen's car was found covered in dirt. It was a huge discovery in this 22-year-old case. The pieces were finally falling into place. They found two bones inside the car, which later confirmed that Karen Moore had been inside the car when it entered the lake. Finally, they found out what had happened to Karen Moore. Lockhart and Rodriguez could not talk about the specifics of the case even when the entire search mission was telecasted live on YouTube. The police suspected foul play and prevented the search teams and even the Moore family from giving interviews about the case. Though the details concerning what's, how's, and why's are still under investigation, a daughter finally got closure about her mother's fate after 22 years. After Karen mysteriously disappeared, Christina was left in the care of her relatives. The comfort and closeness that she felt with her mother could never be substituted. She faced constant ups and downs in her early years. She even ended up in foster care for a time. In times like these, she would miss her mother and pray that she would be found or return home to her. She said every life moment that every little girl hopes and dreams for, you know, to have their mother with them. My own birthdays, when I got engaged and married, now I have two kids. They don't get to know their grandmother. Undoubtedly, Christina Babbert was very close to her mother. Even after all these years, she took to TikTok in 2021, mentioning how she would have liked a little more time with her mother. After 22 long years, Christina finally got some information about her mother. Christina could not get all the answers that had bothered her for years. But she showed her gratitude to police and search teams as she finally got to bring Karen back home and lay her to rest in peace. A further probe into the case of Karen Moore's disappearance is active and ongoing. Davy police sent an email to Fox News Digital stating that they had a meeting with the detectives, but they could not comment on the case as it might hinder the possible outcome of the investigation. After the discovery of her remains in the pond, the next set of urgent questions appeared. How did Karen end up in the pond? If the police's suspicions are right, what was the motive behind this crime? Who was responsible for the 22 years of agony for Christina and the whole Moore family? Now that Karen has returned home after 22 years, all hope is not lost in her case. The dedication of the police department and the technological advancement in sonar systems resulted in a partial success. 
The answers may seem blurry right now, but justice for Karen may be just around the corner. If anyone out there knows anything, do not hesitate to come forward as your information could be invaluable to unmask a decades-old mystery. Did Karen die because of an accident or was it something more sinister? Do you think any further progress will be made in this case? Let us know your thoughts in the comment section. On October 3, 1974, the bodies of 16-year-old Donald Barton and 18-year-old Peter Zito were discovered at the Oak Hills Recreational Center in Aloha by a newspaper delivery driver in the early hours of the morning. The residents of the peaceful neighborhood were left shaken and confused, struggling to understand the act of brutality that had occurred on their streets. The shockwaves of the senseless crime reverberated throughout the city. And for years, detectives were baffled as to who the culprit behind this act could be. Who could have killed these innocent teenage boys? What could be the reason behind this gruesome murder? Today, we'll delve into a case that remained unsolved for 48 long years until justice was finally served in 2022. But first, if you are new to the channel or haven't subscribed yet, please consider clicking the subscribe button as it helps us and motivates us to create more content for you. So without further ado, let's dive right into this mystery. Today, our story takes us to Aloha, an unincorporated community nestled between Beaverton and Hillsboro in Oregon. Despite being unincorporated, Aloha offers all the conveniences of a bustling city, including a post office, library, and schools. Golf enthusiasts can tee off at the prestigious Reserve Vineyards and Golf Club known for its breathtaking views and top-notch facilities. Meanwhile, beer aficionados can head to the 649 Tap House and Bottle Shop to try out new brews from its selection of 20 taps of craft beer and kombucha. For gamers, Rainy Day Games offers a variety of children's games, strategy games, and disc golf products. But it was here in this sleepy community that a senseless act of violence took place in 1974. Donald Barton was born in 1959 in Aloha, an unincorporated community in Oregon. His mother's name was Irene Barton. He went to Aloha High School and used to live with his family. Barton was a great hockey player and used to play for his high school. Barton also used to work at the bustling Black Angus restaurant part-time. And at night, he worked at the recreational center. Peter Zito was born in 1957 in Aloha. He was a student at Aloha High School. Zito too had an interest in ice hockey and used to practice it whenever he had time. Zito also used to work at the recreational center at night with Barton. Not much is known about his personal history, but an interview with his elder sister, Barbara Zito, sheds light on his personal life. According to those who knew him best, he used to cherish the simple joys of life. Zito was a gentle boy who had a deep affection for his 1956 Oldsmobile and the four feline members of his family. Though he had dropped out of Aloha High School and taken up a job as a dishwasher, he held on to aspirations of obtaining his diploma through Portland Community College. It's a reminder that even in tragedy, there are stories of ordinary people with dreams and passions that deserve to be remembered. On the quiet evening of the 3rd of October 1974, two boys, Donald Barton, who was 16 at the time, and Peter Zito Jr., who was 18, we're working on Zito's 1956 Oldsmobile car at 2 a.m. in the Oak Hills Recreation Center parking lot. They had no idea that it would be their last night on Earth. As they tinkered with the engine of the car, an unknown assailant approached them and murdered them in cold blood by shooting them both. What should have been a routine night turned into a nightmare for the families and loved ones of these teenagers. The next morning, the horror was discovered by an Oregon newspaper delivery driver who stumbled upon the crime scene. The bodies of the two boys lay lifeless, almost as if time had stood still. The senseless violence had robbed them of their youth, their dreams, and their future. The newspaper delivery driver, with shaking hands, called the police and reported what he had seen at the crime scene. Within minutes, sirens were blaring as detectives and forensic investigators arrived. The gruesome sight left the investigators reeling with shock and disbelief, but without wasting any time, they started the inspection of the crime scene carefully. With a closer inspection, it was clear that Donald Barton had been working on the 1956 Oldsmobile in the parking lot under the hood of a car when he was ruthlessly shot in the back of his head. His body was found slumped over the open hood of the car, as if he had been taken by surprise while working on the engine. Next to the Oldsmobile lay the body of Peter Zito Jr., who likely got out from the back seat of the car to see what had happened to Donald and was shot in the forehead. He had been found lying on the ground next to the driver's door. 
The proximity of the two bodies suggested that the killer had struck without warning and that the victims had been unable to defend themselves against the attacker. After gathering all the information from the crime scene, the investigators then interviewed anyone who had been near the recreation center on the night of the murders. They followed up on every possible lead, no matter how insignificant it might have seemed. They asked everyone who lived nearby if there were any screams that they heard or any abnormal activity that they encountered on the night of the murder. The investigators worked tirelessly to gather any leads that could help them solve the case. They found that the teenage boys were shot in the head with a .22 caliber gun. As their investigation proceeded, they learned that Barton had a rivalry with a 17-year-old co-worker named Chris at the bustling Black Angus restaurant in Hillsboro. Nobody quite knew what the root of their feud was, but it was evident that there was tension in the air between the two of them. Despite Chris being the prime suspect in the minds of many, the police had to move carefully in their investigation because they knew they could risk making any mistakes. Investigators thought Chris had a motive for the murder, but without any concrete evidence, they decided to pursue another suspect. During the investigation of the Oak Hill murders, a man came forward and informed the investigators that he had witnessed an assault on Joseph Amir Wilson at the recreation center on the night of the murder. Investigators believed Wilson could have mistaken the boys for someone else and shot Zito and Barton in retaliation for the assault. The case of the Oak Hills double murder took a puzzling turn when Joseph Amir Wilson, who was 18 years old and also a student of Aloha High School, was arrested and charged with the brutal killings of Donald Barton and Peter Zito Jr. As investigators delved deeper into the case, they stumbled upon a cache of weapons and knives at the home of Wilson. More than 100 knives and an array of guns were found during a search of his residence. Among the weapons was a loaded .38 caliber gun hidden under Wilson's pillow. When investigators questioned him about the weapons, Wilson explained that they belonged to his late father. While his explanation was being investigated, all the guns were sent for testing, and it was revealed that none of the guns were a match for the one used in the brutal murders of Zito and Barton. The investigation continued as they tried to piece together the mystery of who was responsible for the heinous crime. While Wilson vehemently denied any involvement in the crime, the investigators were not ready to release him and continued their investigation. The more investigators delved into the case, the more they began to question whether Wilson was truly guilty. As the case proceeded, Wilson's defense team presented a compelling argument that he was not responsible for the deaths of Barton and Zito Jr. The prosecution's case was built on circumstantial evidence and the fact that there was no direct proof linking Wilson to the crime. Despite the doubts and the lingering questions, Wilson was eventually released. Many people in the community were left with a sense of unease, wondering if the killer was still out there walking among them. Initially, investigators had suspected Chris due to his tension with Barton at their workplace, bustling Black Angus restaurant in Hillsboro, but didn't interrogate him as he was under 18. They focused on Wilson, another suspect, but when he was found innocent, this brought their attention back to Chris. This time, they investigated Chris further. When Chris was arrested for theft, the investigators found a .22 caliber gun in his car, sparking new hope for a break in the case. The gun was then sent for testing to see if it was the same gun used in the murder of the two boys. Despite the promising lead, the gun could not be matched to the bullets at the crime scene, once again leaving investigators at a dead end. As the months turned into years, the case went cold and the families of the victims were left with no answers and no justice. The case remained unsolved, leaving everyone in doubt about the truth of what happened on that fateful night and if it would ever come to light. The Washington County Sheriff's Office was determined to close this cold case and decided to reopen the investigation in 2022 and rerun ballistics on the .22 caliber gun that had been used to shoot the two innocent teenage boys, Barton and Zito. The detectives had suspected Chris back then, but they couldn't match the gun found in his possession to the murder scene. However, with advances in forensic technology, specifically congruent matching cells technology, they finally confirmed that the same gun was used to commit both murders and that it had a match in the system that had been used to carry out another murder in 1979. When police looked into the owner of this gun, they were shocked at the identity of the owner. It was none other than Chris, the teenager who police had suspected all those years ago. Investigators now took an in-depth look into where Chris was now to see what he had done in the years following the murders. Mark Allen Chris, finally identified as the culprit for the double murder case, was 65 years old now and was living in Aloha, the small community located 12 miles west of Portland. 
The story of the .22 caliber gun used during the murder of Donald Barton and Peter Zito Jr. took a dark turn when it was discovered that it had been used in another gruesome killing. In 1974, when Chris was released by the investigators as no match was found from the ballistics of the gun, the gun was returned to him and he then carried it with him to the Fort Lewis United States Army base in Washington. It was there that Chris used the same weapon to murder his commanding officer, Sergeant Jacob Kim Brown, on the 8th of October 1979, almost five years to the date that Barton and Zito were killed. Chris shot his boss in the head five times over a petty argument, according to police reports. The cadet had damaged Brown's car, and instead of paying for repairs, he chose to take his life when they got into an argument. Chris was sentenced to 35 years in jail for the murder of Sergeant Brown. However, fate had a different plan for him. He was released after just 12 years on parole in 1988, a decision that did not sit well with the family of his victim. But this time, in 2022, when the case reopened, he was finally out of luck and when the match was found. It was announced that this was the same .22 caliber gun that was used in 1974 to kill Zito and Barton at the recreational center. Chris, who had been living in Aloha, a small community located 12 miles west of Portland, was arrested on the 2nd of November 2022 and charged with two counts of second-degree murder. The news of his arrest sent shockwaves throughout the town and people could not believe that justice had only been served after all these years. The arrest of Chris and the confirmation of the gun match marked a historic moment with the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms and Explosives describing it as the oldest known match nationwide that they have ever confirmed. It was a long-awaited moment for the families of Donald Barton and Peter Zito Jr. who had waited for almost five decades for justice to be served. The reopening of this case and the arrest of the suspect was a testament to the hard work and dedication of the detectives who had never given up on bringing the killer to justice. It also gave hope to other families of victims of cold cases that justice may still be possible no matter how long it takes. The families of the victims have been waiting for this moment for decades and their unwavering devotion to finding justice for their loved ones has finally paid off. The sheriff's office wanted to recognize their commitment and the courage it took to keep fighting for so many years. However, in their quest for justice, the sheriff's office inadvertently wronged an innocent man. Joseph Amir Wilson was arrested and charged for the murders just hours after they happened, but it was clear he was innocent. The charges against him were dropped, but the damage had been done. The sheriff's office formally apologized to any relatives of Wilson for this injustice in hopes that someday they can make a personal direct apology. The case was a team effort with multiple agencies working together to bring closure to the families and justice for the victims. The Oregon State Crime Lab, the Pierce County Sheriff's Department, the ATF, and the CID all played a crucial role in solving this case. The Sheriff's Office hopes that the families of the victim can find peace now that the killer has been brought to justice. The pain of losing a loved one never truly goes away, but knowing that the person responsible has been held accountable can provide some solace. In the news conference, Sheriff Pat Garrett stepped up to the podium, his eyes scanning the room until they fell on the families of the victims. His heart went out to them, knowing that their pain had been a constant companion for over 48 years. I want to acknowledge the loss of your loved ones many years ago and what you've had to endure waiting for today, he said, his voice firm yet sympathetic. One of the family members, Peter Zito's sister, Barbara, couldn't help but remember her brother as the happy-go-lucky kid he was before his life was tragically cut short. Tears threatened to spill from her eyes as she listened to the sheriff's words. He was just a happy kid and it was terrible when I heard he was gone, she whispered to herself. The news of Chris's arrest brought a sense of relief but also a flood of questions. The families of the victims left the news conference with mixed emotions, grateful for the long-awaited justice but also aware that the pain of losing their loved ones would never fully go away. The journey to closure was a long and difficult one but they could find comfort in knowing that the killer was behind bars. It is chilling to think that the case of Donald Barton and Peter Zito remained unsolved for over 48 years. But thanks to the dedication and persistence of law enforcement and forensic investigators, justice was finally served. It is a reminder that no matter how long it takes, the truth will always come to light. On July 5, 1966, in Pecos, Texas, a young couple checked into the Ropers Motel under the name Mr. and Mrs. Russell Batten. But soon after, they found themselves caught up in a shocking tragedy that would leave one of them dead. While the man was sleeping in the room, his partner was found unresponsive in the motel swimming pool. 
What exactly happened that led to her untimely demise in the water? Is it possible that she was the victim of foul play and that someone deliberately caused her to meet such a tragic end? We're talking about the 55-year-old cold case whose victim's identity remained unknown until 2023. But first, if you haven't subscribed to our channel by now, please consider hitting the subscribe and like buttons. Let's dive deep into the mystery without further ado. This horrible crime took place in Pecos, a city located in the western part of the state of Texas in the United States. It is the county seat of Reeves County and has a population of approximately 8,000 people. The city is known for its historical significance as a trading post and stopover on the cattle drives of the late 1800s. Today, Pecos is an important hub for the oil and gas industries as well as agriculture and transportation. The city is also home to various cultural attractions, including the west of the Pecos Museum, which showcases the region's history and heritage. Just outside the West Texas community of Pecos, along Highway 80, stood a small motor court with a glowing neon sign and a single level covered in Spanish tile. The motel was a popular spot for oil field workers and truck drivers passing through the area. Sandy Moore, a 15-year-old girl from Clovis, New Mexico, was spending her summer at the motel run by her grandparents. As part of her duties, she worked at the front desk, cleaned rooms, and even waited tables at the on-site cafe. On July 5, 1966, Sandy noticed a couple who had registered under the names Mr. and Mrs. Russell Batten earlier that same day, relaxing in plastic chairs next to the pool at the Roper's Motel. The man was enjoying a beer while the woman sipped on soda. She had long, dark hair and was wearing a red one-piece bathing suit. The man was slim with a blonde crew cut and looked around 10 years older than his companion. Moore was at the motel office about three hours after she first encountered the batons when a distressed maid hurried in and frantically tried to communicate with her in weak English. The maid then accompanied Moore to the pool where she made a startling discovery. At the bottom of the deep end, about 12 feet underwater, a woman was lying face down. Moore entered the scene completely clothed because no one else was nearby until a hotel guest who had been drawn by the ruckus leapt into aid. She had twice failed to bring the body to the surface. Together, they were able to lift the woman out of the pool. It was Mrs. Batten. Moore started CPR as an ambulance was called. When a different hotel staff member entered the Baton's room, he discovered Russell, who appeared to be sleeping. His wife was en route to the nearby Reeves County Memorial Hospital by the time he arrived at the pool. Russell explained to Moore that he needed his registration card to identify himself to authorities before leaving for that location. It was quite suspicious because when she gave it to him, he got into a dark automobile and sped off. Mrs. Batten was confirmed dead when she arrived at the hospital. Russell didn't show up, which is shocking to think of as he cruelly neglected to show up to grieve her departure and left her to leave this world without the comfort of his presence. In this case, as the police did not know the identity of the victim, they assigned her the name Pecos Jane Doe as a reference to the city in Texas where the crime occurred. This was done in hopes of generating leads and identifying the victim through public outreach and media attention. Although Pecos Jane Doe's family did not come forward or identify her, some heartbroken parents were so moved by the young girl's resemblance to their own daughter that they established the Drowned Girl Trust Fund to help pay for her funeral expenses. The tragedy also deeply affected many Pecos residents who rallied to contribute in their own ways. The funeral director generously donated a beautiful wooden casket while a local clothing store provided a blue polka dot dress for the deceased. Others in the community came together to purchase a simple headstone for her grave which bore the inscription, Unknown Girl Drowned. Because nobody knew the drowned woman's religion, her funeral service attended by about 50 locals was conducted by both a Catholic priest and a Protestant minister. Three sheriff's deputies and three police officers served as pallbearers. The minister conveyed to the mourners that the girl was known to them, but they were certain that she was known to God. He hoped that if there was someone who cared for her, they would know that she was now surrounded by love and care. The unidentified woman's body was buried in Fairview Cemetery, which was owned by the city and located across the street from Pecos High School. Sandy Moore, who had encountered the woman's supposed companion at Roper's Motel, was deeply affected by the tragedy. She made a point to lay flowers at the grave every time she returned to town. She later spoke about her feelings over the incident on the phone from her home near Lubbock, admitting how she had thought about it so much over the years. It was hard not knowing where the woman had come from and if anyone was looking for her. Sheriff A.B. Nail of Reeves County wasted no time in alerting his team to search for the man. 
However, the investigation was off to a rough start due to limited information. Without the registration card, the police didn't know the make or license plate number of the man's car. All that was left behind in the Batons motel room was a blouse, bra, and a pair of shorts. The sheriff's office attempted to track down Russell Batten, but the only person with that name they could locate was an active duty Marine stationed in North Carolina. It was evident that the couple had been using false identities, adding another layer of mystery to the already baffling case. Since Reeves County lacked a medical examiner, an expert pathologist from Odessa was summoned to perform the autopsy. During the examination, the pathologist noticed a red abrasion that was about the size of a quarter above the woman's left cheekbone. However, it was unclear whether the injury happened before she died or while her body was being pulled from the pool. Despite the lack of evidence of any wrongdoing, the death was labeled an accidental drowning. As a result, Sheriff Nail decided against initiating a homicide investigation. In a later interview with a journalist, it was revealed by Sheriff Nail that the only wrongdoing known about the man was leaving without paying his motel bill. After the autopsy, the woman's body was taken to the Pecos funeral home where it was embalmed and placed in a back parlor with the hope that someone would come forward to identify her. The mysterious drowning made headlines in newspapers across the country which prompted concerned families from states as far as Kentucky and Illinois to contact the funeral home. Some even made the journey to Pecos to see if the deceased was a missing relative. One couple from Odessa believed that they had found their child, but after dental records were examined, it was determined that the body did not belong to their missing loved one. In 1966, the best clue to the woman's identity was a message she'd inadvertently left behind. After her body arrived at the hospital, someone noticed handwriting on the sole of her right foot, inked by a ballpoint pen, where two words, Joe and Lean, were written. Unfortunately, the police could not find any leads through the message, and the case went cold. The absence of a national clearinghouse for missing and unidentified persons caused delays in investigations. In response, a cold case investigator named Todd Matthews founded the volunteer-run Doe Network in 1999. They compiled a database of missing persons and unidentified bodies, receiving hundreds of tips a year and helping solve nearly a hundred cases. The Justice Department created the National Missing and Unidentified Person System, NAMAS, in 2007, partly inspired by the Doe Network. Todd Matthews, who founded the Doe Network, was appointed as NAMAS Director of Communications and Outreach. According to Todd Matthews, he has always had a soft spot for unidentified victims as they tend to receive less attention from the police the longer they remain unnamed. Often, there is no one advocating for them and officers have limited information to work with. Matthews explained that taking on the challenge of identifying an unknown victim is not desirable, particularly when there is no family complaining. He added that with an unidentified body, there is no one to complain as they are already buried. He became interested in the Pecos Jane Doe case and thought that it was time to revisit and further investigate the case in 2019. He organized a team of four detectives and started the investigation. In August 2019, before dawn, the four-man squad, Ingram, Tarango, Salcedo, and Carrasco, who were the investigators Matthews appointed, went to Fairview Cemetery and gathered around the grave of Pecos Jane. They watched as a backhoe operator dug a rectangular hole in the ground, which was around six feet deep. The backhoe hit a wooden coffin and Ingram climbed down into the grave to examine it. Although the coffin had mostly disintegrated after being underground for over five decades, the skeletal remains were still intact. The soil had dyed the bones a reddish tan color and there were pieces of pantyhose and a blue polka dot dress mixed in with the bones. Ingram used a trowel and brush to delicately clear away the soil from the bones, placing them systematically onto a pristine white sheet placed at the edge of the grave. After the entire skeleton was excavated, it was arranged in its correct anatomical structure. The entire skeleton was then wrapped in paper, put in a blue body bag, sealed in a box, and sent for DNA testing. Following the 2019 exhumation of the remains of Pecos Jane Doe, the remains were sent to a lab in Denton, run by forensic examiner Ingram. It was determined that the skeleton belonged to a young white woman aged between 15 and 18 years old. In an effort to identify her, a bone fragment was extracted and sent to Fort Worth, where DNA was extracted and uploaded to the FBI's national database, the Combined DNA Index System, CODES. Unfortunately, no matches were found in the database, which wasn't surprising given that it was established decades after the woman's death. 
Almost after a year had passed since revisiting the mystery Jane Doe in Pecos, Texas, a small package arrived at the doorstep of Authorum, a private forensic laboratory in the Woodlands area of Houston. The package contained a molar extracted from the jaw of the unidentified woman. Authorum, founded in 2018 by David Middleman, a scientist and entrepreneur with a passion for genomics, was the perfect laboratory to examine the molar. Middleman's fascination with genomics began during his time as an undergraduate research assistant on the final stages of the Human Genome Project, a 13-year, $3 billion project that revolutionized modern genetic testing. With the arrival of the package, Middleman and his team were ready to begin their work and hopefully provide some answers to the mystery surrounding Pecos Jane's identity. Pecos Jane's DNA did not match with any entries in the database, which is not unexpected because the database was created in the 1990s, long after her passing. The investigation felt like it came to yet another dead end, and this left the team questioning themselves if they could ever identify who Pecos Jane Doe actually was. Out of the blue, Tarango received an unexpected phone call from Authorum, who offered the services of their laboratory to assist in solving a case. Authorum proposed utilizing a novel method known as forensic genetic genealogy, hoping to employ a new approach to solve the case. They used advanced DNA analysis and genealogical research to find a match for Pecos Jane Doe's DNA profile. Turns out they found three siblings living in Texas who were likely great-grandchildren of one of Pecos Jane's first cousins. These siblings probably didn't even know about their distant relatives and had no idea that uploading their DNA to a public website could help solve a cold case. Unfortunately, we don't know their names because of privacy reasons. In November 2022, Authorum transferred the Pecos Jane Doe case to innovative forensic investigations in the sleepy Virginia town of Emporia, close to the North Carolina border. As part of a deal mediated by NCMEC.IN 2019, private investigator Jennifer Moore established a business, becoming one of the many self-taught forensic genetic genealogists. Moore's interest in this field was sparked while assisting her husband in finding his biological parents. Her team, utilizing standard genealogical methods, meticulously traced the family line of three Texas siblings to the probable common ancestors shared with Pecos Jane. The investigators systematically followed each branch of the family tree looking for individuals approximately Pecos Jane's age at the time of her drowning. After weeks of effort, they honed in on a Kansas family with 15 children. Ten of them were still alive and several had active Facebook accounts, proving to be crucial tools for the genealogists. Among the profiles, they discovered that one brother frequently posted about a sister who had disappeared many years prior. A detective visited Joyce Hemi, a 74-year-old retiree in St. Petersburg, Florida, a few weeks later, representing the Pecos, Texas police. When asked about a missing person in her family, Joyce began to cry, revealing that she was the victim's eldest sister. The tireless efforts of DNA testing led to the identification of the victim's name, Jolene Hemi. Jolene Hemi, raised on a 106-acre farm in central Kansas, was the ninth child of Richard and Alberta Hemi's 15 children. Growing up on a regular farm, the large Catholic family cultivated wheat and bred various animals, providing well for themselves. They occasionally picnicked near Canopolis Lake on weekends, with the kids mainly staying out of the water. Jolene, unable to swim, played a crucial role in the investigation. Described as an extremely shy girl by her eldest sister, Rosemary, Jolene never had a known boyfriend, preferring to read alone rather than engage in social activities. She was particularly close to her oldest sister, Joyce, with whom she did everything together. Sometime during that summer, Jolene had reportedly met an older man at work. Joyce, who met him a few times, estimated he was in his late twenties, about a decade older than Jolene. Joyce did not like him, finding him controlling, but Jolene insisted she liked him. On Friday, July 1, 1966, Jolene stopped by Joyce's house after work, inviting her to watch a movie with her boyfriend and another girl. Joyce declined, having plans to go fishing with her own boyfriend. After this, Jolene did not return to either sister's house, prompting an extensive search. Joyce and Carolyn discovered that Jolene's boyfriend was missing and she hadn't collected her paychecks. When they reported Jolene missing, the police suggested she and her boyfriend might have run away together and would likely return soon. A few days later, Joyce received a postcard stamped in Las Vegas on July 3, 1966, featuring a cryptic message signed, Joe. Joyce became suspicious as the note did not match Jolene's handwriting and Jolene did not go by the name Joe. 
Letters with similar messages were also sent to other family members and Joyce tore hers into pieces. In Kansas City, Joyce and Carolyn put up posters asking if anyone had seen their sister. The only available information about Joe Lane's movements between leaving Kansas City on July 1st and checking into the Roper's Motel on July 5th came from the letter and postcard from Las Vegas. Durango, an investigator, believes Joe Lane's boyfriend may have sent both items. The police considered the possibility of the couple going to Las Vegas to get married, but a search of Nevada's 1966 marriage licenses yielded no results. The police are unsure of how the couple ended up in Pecos, as it seems like an unlikely destination unless the man had some connection to its famous rodeo which ran from July 1st to 4th that year. However, there is no record of a Russell Batten competing in the 1966 rodeo. Many members of the Hemi family think her lover killed Jolene. They point out that she couldn't swim, so why was she in a swimming pool? The biggest unsolved question in Jolene's case pertains to the identity of the man who was with her at the Roper's Motel. If he is still alive, he would likely be in his 80s now. Several members of the Hemi family have voiced their belief that he was responsible for Jolene's murder. Their argument is based on the fact that Jolene couldn't swim, so why would she be in the motel pool? Moreover, there was an abrasion found on the side of her head. Sandy Moore, the granddaughter of the motel owners, remembers seeing broken glass around the pool when she pulled out Jolene's body. It's plausible that the man could have hit Jolene with a beer bottle during an altercation which caused her to fall into the pool and drown. However, it is perplexing that he did not flee the scene immediately after the incident. It's possible that he did not intend to harm Jolene and only panicked after realizing that she had drowned accidentally. Subsequently, he decided to disappear. It is considered an act of extreme cruelty that the man who was with Jolene at the motel has not come forward with any information in the past 55 years whether or not he is responsible for her death. He could have, at some point, provided information to Jolene's family about what happened or at least provided them with a clue to aid in their search for her. While Durango and Salcedo, the members of the four-man detective squad appointed by Matthew as aforementioned, continue their search for the man who left Jolene to an anonymous burial far from home, their hope of finding him is minimal. Furthermore, even if they do locate him, it is unlikely that a criminal prosecution can take place due to the missing case file and the pathologist's ruling that Jolene's death was a result of a dental drowning. Durango expressed that it is unlikely that he can prove that Jolene was murdered. Sandy Massey, who was known by her maiden name, Sandy Moore, at the time of Jolene's death, recalls the day she discovered Jolene's body in the motel pool vividly. She was only 15 years old at the time, and the memory of being deceived into giving away the registration card still haunts her to this day. Despite the passing of over five decades, Sandy still feels remorseful about her and how they may have contributed to Jolene's death. In a recent phone conversation with some of Jolene's siblings, Sandy was thanked for attempting to rescue their sister and was extended an invitation to visit them in Kansas. As we wrap up this video on Jolene Hemi's tragic death, it's clear that the Hemi family will always hold a special place in the hearts of the Pecos community. Both older residents who remember the events of 55 years ago and younger generations who have recently learned about the case through news coverage are likely to extend a warm welcome to the Hemi family. Jolene's death has become part of the town's history and identity, but it will likely be difficult for Detective Tarango, who was in the team working under Matthew with four other detectives, to crack this case and let her memory fade away. It's clear that Jolene Hemi will always be a part of Pecos, Texas. What are your thoughts on this chilling case? Let us know in the comments section below. 24-year-old Rita Karan was brutally murdered in her own apartment in Burlington, Vermont on July 19, 1971. The killer left no clues, no fingerprints, and vanished into thin air. At the time, with forensic and DNA technology not as advanced as it is today, there was not much the police could do. For 52 years, the case lay cold and investigators were left scratching their heads as they tried to comprehend what had happened. Who killed Rita Karan? How did the police solve the case? Today, we are looking at the 52-year-old cold case of Rita Karan that was finally solved in 2019. But first, if you haven't subscribed to our channel yet, please consider hitting the subscribe and like buttons. Let's dive deep into this mystery without further ado. Today's story takes us to Burlington, a city in the state of Vermont in the United States. It possesses a captivating mix of history, culture, and natural beauty, located on the eastern shore of Lake Champlain. The city boasts stunning views of the lake and surrounding mountains. 
Burlington's fascinating history dates back to its founding in 1785, and its vibrant economy is driven by technology, education, healthcare, and tourism. But this mesmerizing city bore witness to a terrible crime that took place on July 20, 1971, and remained unsolved for the next 52 years. On June 20, 1947, Mary Eleanor Donahue Curran and Thomas F. Curran of New York City held their precious daughter for the first time and named her Rita Curran. Rita was the first child that the Curran family had welcomed. As time passed, they had two more children and Rita got to welcome her two younger siblings. She was blessed with a loving and caring younger brother, Thomas Curran Jr., as well as a beautiful and kind younger sister, Mary Curran. The Curran family was well-known and well-liked in the area they resided, especially since her father, Thomas, was the zoning administrator for the community. Growing up, Rita was always a quiet and sweet presence with a shy demeanor that belied her deep reserves of kindness and intelligence. She excelled academically and completed her graduation from Trinity College. She was always passionate about teaching, completing her degree in primary education, and taking graduate courses at the University of Vermont. Rita lived with her family for 24 years until one day she decided to move out. It was the first time she had lived away from them and she moved into an apartment on 17 Brooks Avenue in Burlington, Vermont with three other roommates. She fulfilled her dream when she became a beloved second grade teacher at Milton Elementary School. All her students loved her and she made a lasting impact on their lives. One of her students, Jim Robot, still remembers her five decades later for an act of kindness she showed him when he was in the second grade. While acting in a school play, he used a teddy bear as a prop, which he liked a lot. After the play, he asked Rita if he could keep it and Rita allowed him to do so. Rita was also a talented singer and dancer, often spending her time with her younger sister, Mary, tap dancing and singing together. During the summer, Rita worked part-time as a chambermaid at the South Burlington Colonial Motor Inn where she was known for her hardworking and diligent nature. She was loved by her co-workers and guests alike, who were touched by her warmth and sincerity. Can you imagine the reason for such a quiet, kind, and warm-hearted person to be killed so brutally? What could have been the reason behind her murder? On July 20th, 1971, when Beverly, one of the roommates of Rita, came back home, she had no idea that a horrifying scene was waiting for her. Beverly Lamphere returned late from a date with her boyfriend at 1 a.m. The two other roommates were not staying at the house that night, so it was just her and Rita. As she opened the door, she was immediately hit with the scent of iron, the unmistakable smell of blood. Her eyes adjusted to the darkness and she saw a figure lying on the ground. As she got closer, she realized it was Rita lying partially nude with blood all over her body. Her hair was still in curlers and it looked like she had been preparing for bed when the attack happened. Beverly screamed out for her boyfriend, hoping he could somehow save her friend, but it was already too late. Rita was gone, her life snuffed out in a brutal and senseless act of violence. Beverly's mind raced with questions, who could do such a thing? Why would someone hurt her dear friend? She immediately called the police, scared and disheartened at seeing her friend's demise. The darkness of the night was not comforting and her mind was racing with thoughts about Rita. She had left her dear friend and roommate just a few hours ago and Rita had been happy and excited to have the apartment all to herself. The silence of the night was deafening as Beverly and her boyfriend waited for the police to arrive. They couldn't understand why no one had heard anything, no screams, no sound of a struggle. It was like the killer had disappeared into thin air. After a short while, the police arrived at the scene and began the investigation. At first, investigators thought that Rita may have been murdered for money, but Rita's purse containing about $20 was found untouched, so it became clear that robbery was not the motive. When investigators started to examine the whole apartment, they saw there were bloodstains in the kitchen, indicating that the murderer could possibly have fled from there. After a thorough examination of the crime scene, the body was sent for an autopsy. The brutality of the attack was evident from the moment the chief medical examiner, Lawrence Harris, laid eyes on Rita's lifeless body. Her body was examined carefully and they found violent bruises that covered her face and head. It was clear that she had fought for her life with everything she had, leaving behind signs of a fierce struggle. But in the end, it was the crushing grip of the killer's hands around her neck that had silenced her forever. As if the physical violence wasn't enough, the killer tried to kill her in the most brutal way possible. Her torn clothes were found discarded under her body, a cruel reminder of the heinous act that had taken place. The details of the assault were too gruesome to imagine and it was a small comfort that she had not been sexually assaulted. 
Investigators swarmed the area around 17 Brooks Avenue, searching for any clues that could help solve the brutal murder of beloved teacher and chambermaid Rita Karan. The air was heavy with the weight of the unsolved crime, and residents of the town were on edge, fearful that the killer might still be lurking among them. Investigators went door to door, talking and interrogating the people around 17 Brooks Avenue to see if anyone might have seen or heard something out of the ordinary in the hours leading up to the discovery of Rita's body. They urged residents to think back to that fateful night and to come forward with any information that could help bring justice to the Curran family. The investigators combed through hundreds of leads, pursued every potential angle, and examined every piece of evidence they could find. Despite their best efforts, they hit a dead end. They found a single cigarette button near Rita's lifeless arm, and they hoped it might provide some kind of clue to her killer's identity. But at the time, DNA technology was not advanced enough to extract a profile, and the cigarette butt yielded no useful information. The killer remained a mystery hidden in the shadows, leaving the investigators and the community puzzled. Until one day in 1979, FBI agent John Bassett made a chilling connection. The motel where Karan worked was right next to the infamous Elizabeth Lund home for unwed mothers, the birthplace of none other than notorious serial killer Ted Bundy. As Bassett delved deeper into the case, he noticed uncanny similarities between the crime scene and those of Bundy's known victims. Bundy's modus operandi involved stalking the victims for days or weeks before assaulting them. He broke into his victims' apartments and cased their homes, learning their routines and which doors were unlocked. Rita's sister believed Ted Bundy was responsible for her sister's murder and cited some similarities to his other victims. She emphasized that all of Bundy's victims had long brown hair parted in the middle, which she believed was his motive for revenge against his ex-girlfriend. However, Bundy later stated that his victims were chosen for their youth and attractiveness and not for specific hair color or style. But after looking into the possible similarities, police found that there were details in this case that did not match Bundy's profile. Burlington Police Chief Kevin Scully stated that Bundy would attack his victims when they were asleep, strangle them with a ligature, and use a weapon to bludgeon them. However, Rita was awake and fought back, being strangled manually with fists. Bundy's crimes were usually planned and involved the use of a weapon in ligature, but Rita's murder seemed impulsive and only involved the use of hands and fists. Before Bundy's execution on January 24, 1989, he denied committing any murders in Vermont. The Burlington police stated that they had investigated the possibility of his involvement in the Rita Curran case and concluded that Bundy was elsewhere at the time. Now they were left with no other clues that could lead them to the real killer of Rita and again, the case slowly went cold. For decades, the case of Rita Curran's brutal murder remained a mystery to investigators. But in 2014, a tiny, seemingly insignificant piece of evidence became the key that would unlock the case. It was the cigarette but carelessly discarded near the victim's body that had lain forgotten for years. Detectives knew that it was a long shot, but they were able to extract a DNA profile from the cigarette butt and submit it to the National Criminal Database. Unfortunately, no matches were found. It was a puzzling and frustrating dead end, but Detective Lieutenant James Treb refused to give up. He knew that this DNA profile could be the key to unlocking the case, but he needed to think outside the box. In 2019, he made a bold move and gathered a team of experts to review the evidence, taking a fresh approach to the decades-old case. They combed through every piece of evidence with a fine-tooth comb, determined to find the missing puzzle piece that would crack the case wide open. Treb knew that they needed a new strategy, and they found it in genetic genealogy. They decided to use this cutting-edge tech to analyze the DNA profile found on the cigarette but discovered at the scene of the crime. They delved deep into DNA databases, hoping to find a match for the genetic material that had eluded them for so long. Their hard work paid off when an outside expert in genetic genealogy was able to connect the DNA to relatives of a man named William DeRouse. The relative they then contacted was the half-brother of DeRouse, who was willing to give them his DNA sample. His DNA helped to finally conclude with certainty that DeRouse was the one who left behind the cigarette but found at the scene of the crime. When police looked into DeRouse's whereabouts at the time of the murder, they found he was living two floors above Rita's apartment at 17 Brooks Avenue. With this breakthrough, they finally had the key to unlock the mystery of Rita Curran's murder. The investigation proceeded and investigators now found additional DNA evidence on Curran's ripped housecoat that matched the DNA on the cigarette but found near her body. This discovery strengthened the case against DeRouse as it linked him to the crime scene in a more concrete manner. 
They then looked into his past and found out that William D. Rouse was married to Shell in the summer of 1971 in Burlington just about two weeks before the murder. They were newlyweds who were living in the same building just two floors above Rita Curran when she was brutally murdered in 1971. Furthermore, investigators were able to re-enter D. Rouse's then-wife, who had previously lied about his alibi when they had interviewed her during the initial investigation and she admitted to her falsehood. She told them that she had been threatened by D. Rouse to say that they were together on the night of the murder, but the truth was that they had had an argument and D. Rouse went outside for a walk to try and cool down. She had no idea about what happened when D. Rouse was gone. Her admission was a key factor in the investigation as it helped to establish De Rouse's guilt beyond any reasonable doubt. She also told them that shortly after the crime, De Rouse had left her and moved to Thailand to become a monk. Three years later, he resurfaced in San Francisco where he met his second wife, Sarah Hepting. Detectives contacted Sarah, his second wife as well, and asked her about De Rouse. Sarah's account of De Rouse was chilling. She told Burlington police that he once stabbed a woman right in front of her, but luckily she survived the attack. In addition, she revealed that he had tried to strangle her in the same manner that Karan was killed. All of this, along with evidence found against him and the confession of his first wife, was enough for the police to be sure that they had their culprit. But sadly, despite the victory in solving the case, the day was bittersweet for the police, as when they looked into Deerhouse, they learned that he had already died of a drug overdose in 1986. The news of the breakthrough in Rita Karen's murder case sent shockwaves through the community, bringing a mix of emotions for those who knew her and those who had only heard of her through stories. For Mary Campbell, Karan's sister, the case had haunted her family for generations. We now have two generations in our family who never knew her, she said with a heavy heart, but through the tears and the pain, there was a glimmer of hope. Thomas Karan, Rita's brother, found solace in the support of his loved ones. I prayed to my parents and I prayed to Rita. My wife Nancy tells me we will get through this. We are Karan strong, he said, and his voice was filled with determination. As news of the arrest spread, messages of praise and gratitude poured in from all corners. Former Burlington Police Brandon Delpo, who had worked on the case, expressed his admiration for the hard-working detectives who never gave up. This is one of those cases where I regretted that I couldn't find the killer, but I'm so proud of the Burlington Police Department, he said, and his voice was filled with pride. Jim Rabar, the former student of Quran, spoke as well, saying she was beautiful from the inside out. She told me that I could keep the teddy bear, and I still have the teddy bear. I just can't find it, he said, with a heavy heart. Rabar's sentiment was echoed by many in the community who remembered Quran as a dedicated teacher who had a passion for education and helping others learn. Her legacy will continue to live on in the hearts and minds of those who knew her and those who only know her through the stories that have been passed down through generations. We hope you've enjoyed this gripping story of how this cold case was solved after more than 50 years. The tireless efforts of investigators and the advancements in forensic technology have allowed this case to finally be solved, bringing closure to the loved ones of the victim. Now we want to hear from you. What are your thoughts on this case? Were you impressed by the way it was finally solved? Share your opinions in the comments section below. For more than 20 years, the case of Army Private Amanda Gonzalez, who was only 19 and pregnant when she was found strangled in her barracks on November 3, 2001, has remained unsolved. Despite efforts to find her killer, the trail had gone cold for many years. Who could potentially be responsible for the murder of an Army Private? Was it someone from her barracks or an outsider? During the Cold War, a now Germany was developed into a significant and United States Army Aviation Center, referred to as Fleigerhorst Army Airfield. In 1952, various construction ventures were to re-establish the airfield's military identity. These initiatives included the construction of barracks, hangars, administrative buildings, and other facilities necessary to support the military personnel and their aircraft. As a result, HANA became an essential facility for the U.S. military during the Cold War. Amanda was born on December 8, 1981, in Hearn, Robertson County, Texas, to her parents, Gloria and Santos Gonzalez. Unfortunately, their parents separated when she was still young. Yet, Amanda wasn't deprived of fatherly love in her life. Her mother, Gloria, met a man and got married to him. From 1986, when she was just five years old, she lived with her stepfather, Michael Bates. Amanda spent her formative years in Madisonville, Texas, excelled academically throughout high school and harbored a passion for becoming a pediatric physical therapist. Private Gonzalez possessed a desire to explore the world. 
Hence, when the chance to enlist in the army and serve in Europe after she graduated Madisonville High School in 2000 came up, Amanda seized it without hesitation. I'm in, Gloria recollected her daughter saying. In March 2001, Amanda was deployed to Germany. In the picturesque German town of Flagahorse, where the sounds of military drills and aircraft filled the air, Amanda Gonzalez would spend the following months honing her skills as a cook in the U.S. Army. Away from her home in the Lone Star state of Texas, Amanda felt a sense of excitement and adventure, eager to take on new challenges and opportunities. In November of 2001, which was her first assignment in the Army, Amanda was assigned to the headquarters supply company of the 127th Aviation Support Battalion as a cook. Amanda was anxious and happy to tell her mother about her pregnancy, so she picked up the phone and decided to tell her immediately. With a trembling voice, she revealed to her beloved mom that she was expecting a child despite being only 19 years old and on her first assignment in the Army. Despite the shock and unexpected news, Amanda's mother, Gloria Bates, could sense the joy and anticipation in her daughter's voice as she shared her plans to name the child Alicia Marie. As Amanda navigated the challenges of being a young pregnant soldier in a foreign land, she knew that the love and support of her family back home would be her guiding light. And so, with a heart full of hope and determination, Amanda embraced this new chapter in her life, ready to face whatever lay ahead with courage and resilience. As Miss Bates also mentioned, Private Gonzalez made the most of her leisure time by exploring German castles and taking a road trip to Paris with her friend. However, she confided in her cousins that she was a victim of bullying by some female counterparts on the military base who were eager to engage in physical confrontations. Undeterred, Private Gonzalez demonstrated remarkable courage and defended herself and others against these bullies. Miss Bates said that they referred to her as a firecracker because she was always prepared to explode. She added that her daughter was self-reliant and took care of herself, so she believed that she put up a strong resistance. On November 3, 2001, Army Private Amanda Gonzalez was just 19 years old and four months pregnant when she did not report for work, which was highly unlike Amanda. Soldiers broke down the door to her barracks and found her lifeless body. She had been strangled and her death was considered a brutal and violent crime. Her death was classified as a homicide caused by suffocation. According to the FBI, she was four months pregnant. The investigation into her death likely involved interviews with her colleagues and friends, forensic analysis of the crime scene, and other methods of evidence gathering. However, it appears that none of these efforts were able to lead to a breakthrough in the case, and the trail of her killer went cold. Despite an investigation by military authorities and the civilian police, her killer was not identified and the case remained unsolved for over two decades. This means that the person or persons responsible for her death have remained at large for longer than Amanda Gonzalez lived, which is a tragic and sobering realization. The fact that this case remained unsolved for so long is a reminder of the devastating impact that violent crime can have on individuals, families, and communities. It also highlights the challenge that law enforcement agencies face when trying to solve crimes, particularly when evidence is scarce or leads are few and far between. For 20 long years, the family of the victim was left in a state of unrelenting despair and unimaginable agony. The perpetrator of the heinous crime, the culprit who took away the life of an innocent woman, remained free and unpunished while the loved ones of the victim were left to pick up the shattered pieces of their lives. Despite the unbearable pain and anguish that she was forced to endure, Gloria refused to let the memory of her daughter fade away into obscurity. She valiantly fought to keep the investigation alive, tirelessly seeking justice for her child who was taken away from her far too soon. With unwavering determination, the mother wrote letters to members of Congress, begging them to take action and bring the perpetrator to justice. She even reached out to popular television shows like Dr. Phil and America's Most Wanted, hoping that the wider exposure would help to turn up new leads and bring the killer to justice. But despite all of her efforts, justice remained elusive, the years continued to tick by, and still no one was charged with the crime. It is difficult to imagine the pain and heartbreak that Gloria Bates and her family must have felt knowing that the person responsible for their loved one's death was still out there, free to live their life without any consequences. The Army commemorated the 10th anniversary of Private Gonzalez's death in 2011 by offering a $120,000 reward for information. Army investigators were hoping that the reward would encourage people to come forward with any relevant information that could help solve the case. 
CID spokesman Chris Gray stated that keeping the reward to $125,000 demonstrated their determination to solve the case and bring the responsible person or persons to justice. He further added that they were confident that someone out there had information regarding the untimely death of the soldier and her unborn child and that they were not giving up. Gray strongly encouraged anyone with information to contact them immediately. Despite the offered reward, no progress was made in solving the case. It remains unsolved or cold. The FBI allegedly called Gloria 22 years after the murder to inform her that an arrest had finally been made. Unfortunately, the specifics of how police located and arrested the perpetrator have not been made public. Authorities detained 42-year-old former soldier Shannon L. Wilkerson on February 23, 2023, on suspicion of killing Gonzalez, they announced. He was later discovered to have been a member of the armed forces during the time of Gonzalez's demise. He was discharged from active duty in 2004, just three years after Amanda's death. The investigation was being assisted by the Department of the Army Criminal Investigation Division, though privacy regulations prohibit the divulgence of any soldier's discharge characterization. At the time of the murder, Shannon L. Wilkerson would have been 21 years old. And according to the Andalusia Star News, he hails from Andalusia, Alabama. As per the news outlet, the individual was operating a fitness center named CardioZone in the region back in 2015. Wilkerson was charged under the Military Extraterritorial Jurisdiction Act, which gave the U.S. federal courts jurisdiction over crimes committed by the United States by, among others, former members of the armed forces who are no longer subject to the Uniform Code of Military Justice. Wilkerson was charged with one count of first-degree murder, and if he was convicted, he faced a maximum penalty of life in prison. According to court documents, the defendant entered a plea of not guilty during a hearing held after his arrest on February 23, 2023. It has been reported that a trial date has been scheduled for March 27, 2023, in Pensacola, Florida. Miss Bates, the mother of Amanda Gonzalez, has been informed by investigators that DNA evidence is being examined in the case, although it is unclear whether DNA evidence has linked Mr. Wilkerson to the crime. She plans to attend Mr. Wilkerson's detention hearing in the U.S. District Court for the Northern District of Florida, which is scheduled to take place in March. As the investigation into the untimely demise of the victim continues, the diligent efforts of the Federal Bureau of Investigation remain steadfast. Despite their tireless work, the motive behind the gruesome killing remains shrouded in mystery, leaving the authorities unable to provide any conclusive details at this time. However, the seasoned professionals at the FBI refuse to relent and are leaving no stone unturned in their pursuit of justice for the victim and closure for their loved ones. The principle of innocent until proven guilty is a cornerstone of justice and rightly so. However, for the family of a victim, it can be difficult to accept this principle when they feel that their loved one's perpetrator has yet to face justice. While it is important to respect the legal process, it is also understandable that the family yearns for closure and justice for their loss. Ultimately, we must strive for a balance between the principle of justice and compassion for those affected by crime. What are your thoughts on the suspect? Do you think he is guilty or innocent until proven guilty? Please share your thoughts in the comments section below.